Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished media representatives, welcome to the online workshop titled Media Literacy Against Discrimination, organized by the Ministry of Culture and Media of the Republic of Serbia. My name is Zoran Stanovic, and I will moderate this workshop today. Information shared by various platforms, citizens, media, and books shape the perception of various cultures, religions, and ethnic groups with stereotypes and preconceptions of byproducts in the course. In order to uphold the culture of tolerance, social inclusion, and dialogue, and hamper prejudice and discrimination in the public sphere, a critical understanding of the functions of digital media and information systems is indispensable, and that is to be discussed on this workshop. I would now ask Slavica Trifunovic, Assistant Minister of Information and Media of the Republic of Serbia, to address us in front of the Ministry of Culture and Media and to open today's workshop. Mrs. Trifunovic, Please, the screen is yours. Hvala, gospodine Stanojeviću. Uvaženi panelisti, poštovana publiko, dozvolite mi da vas pozdravim u ime Ministarstva kulture i informisanja i da vam se zahvalim na učešću na današnjoj radionici koju organizujemo u cilju jačanja kapaciteta aktera u oblasti informisanja i medija, a u skladu sa aktivnostima predviđenim akcijalnim planom za poglavlje 23, koje se odnosi i na osnovna ljudska prava. Izveštaj o napretku Srbije konstatuje da je u ovoj oblasti u proteklom periodu ostvaren ograničen napredak, te stoga, sprovodeći dalje aktivnosti u okviru postojećih mehanizama, Ministarstvo nastavlja da predano radi na poboljšanju medijskog okruženja. Sloboda izražavanja i sloboda medija su među najvažnijim stubovima funkcionalne demokratije. Nezavisni i kvalitetni mediji su ključni, ne samo zbog pružanja istinitih i verodostojnih informacija koje građanima omogućavaju da budu informisani za donošenje odluka i da igraju aktivnu ulogu u građanskom društvu, već su neizmerno važni i za pozivanje na odgovornost i u tom pogledu predstavljaju ključnog saveznika za temeljno sprovođenje vladavine prava. Pravo na formiranje i izražavanje mišljenja zajedno sa slobodom informisanja i slobodom medija koje iz njega proizilaze, od presudnog je značaja za ostvarivanje i zaštitu svih ostalih ljudskih prava. Funkcionalni sistem zaštite ljudskih prava nezamisliv je bez zabrane diskriminacije kao opšteg principa. U tom sistemu jednakost nesumljivo zauzima centralno mesto. Pravo na jednakost i načelo jednakosti sastavni su deo i preduslov osvarivanja i efikasne zaštite svakog drugog ljudskog prava. Pojava digitalnih tehnologija uticala je na konvergenciju medija i postavila nove izazove kada su u pitanju sloboda izražavanja, etika i vrednosti. Pristup tehnologiji, veštinama i podacima postali su važna konkurentna prednost za velike platforme i društvene medije, kao i za mehanizme za pretraživanje. U odnosu na tradicionalne medijske kuće, naročito one manje, i one koje se nalaze u područjima sa ograničenom digitalnom infrastrukturom. Osim toga, dok tradicionalni mediji mogu da budu pozvani na odgovornost zbog sadržaja koje objavljuju i podležu uredničkim pravilima i etici u pogledu tačnosti sadržaja i kredibilnosti izvora, što se odnosi i na komentare čitalaca, Online platforme koriste izuzeće od odgovornosti za sadržaj koji je kreiran od strane korisnika do kojeg omogućavaju pristup. 
o ovom kontekstu i alatima pomoću koji se može uticati na izgradnju i pridržavanje visokih etičkih principa i standarda, danas ćemo imati prilike da čujemo od renomiranih stručnjaka različitih ekspertiza. Svakako, jedan od alata je medijska pismenost, na čijem sistemskom unapređenju Ministarstvo kulture i informisanja godinama predano radi, jer samo osnaživanjem aktera koji dolaze iz različitih sektora, od javnog do privatnog, kao i građana svih starostnih dobi, polova i društveno-ekonomskih grupa kroz ciljane programe medijske i informacijone pismenosti možemo pozitivno uticati na etiku i vrednosti u digitalnom dobu. U uverenju da će današnja radionica biti korak napred u osnaživanju kompetencija medijskih aktera u borbi protiv diskriminacije svake vrste, želim vam uspešan rad i konstruktivnu diskusiju. Zahvaljujem se na pažnje. Thank you, Mrs. Trifonović. Now I would like to introduce our panelists. They are Dr. Sejal Parmar, lecturer at School of Law, University of Sheffield, Francesca Bonelli, UNHCR representative in the Republic of Serbia, then uh, Dr. Maha Bashri, associate professor of communication, Department of Media and Creative Industries, United Arab Emirates University, Brankica Janković, Commissioner for Gender Equality of the Republic of Serbia. Dr. Stephen Ward, media ethicist, author of the invention of journalism ethics, the path to objectivity and beyond. Uh, and Dr. Valerie Friedland, Professor of Soci Sociolinguistic and former Director of Graduate Studies at the University of Nevada, Nevada in Reno. I hope she will join us. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us today and share your uh, knowledge and experience. And uh, I will now announce that all panelists will have their 20 minute presentation, after which we will open the discussion and answer questions. Please send your questions in the chat box so we can answer them in a timely manner. I will ask Dr. Sejal Palmer to start first. Please take the screen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and my thanks to the uh, Ministry of Culture and Information of the Republic of Serbia for the opportunity to engage with representative of stakeholders in the Serbian media sector, including regulatory and self-regulatory bodies, um, journalist associations and media outlets on this um, important subject of ethics and values in the digital age. Um, so in my presentation as an international human rights lawyer, um, I would like to, um, first of all, recognize some of the ways in which the Serbian context has been highlighted by regional and international human rights bodies, um, specifically in relation to the role and responsibility of the media when it comes to issues around discrimination um, and hate speech. And, and then um, look at what should be the role of the media, as well as um, um, others, particularly media regulators, um, in terms of addressing um, and um, uh, challenging discrimination. Um, and as I indicated, as, as an uh, international human rights lawyer, I'll do that from an international human rights law perspective. Um, but just at the outset, I'd just like to highlight um, just how much activity there has been in this area over recent years um, in the human rights field um, in terms of addressing discrimination, which um, is advanced by, propagated by, disseminated by the media. Um, and although over um, recent um, times in, in the last couple of years, there has been an intense level of concentration um, on the role of social media, actually, um, um, historically, um, since 2008 approximately, there has been a growing attention on traditional media, legacy media, and the role of um, uh, mainstream media, um, which I think deserves um, reconsideration, amplification, and a better understanding, um, uh, including by um, the media organizations themselves. So there are a range of sources that uh, media organizations and regulators at the national level um, ought to um, be looking at um, 
when considering how to develop media policy um, um, on issues surrounding discrimination. Um, uh, these include, for example, the Camden Principles on Freedom of Expression and Equality, um, which were developed by a leading NGO in the area, um, Article 19, um, uh, which contain recommendations for mainstream media. Uh, and from the human rights bodies, there are a series of um, important texts, most notably the Rabat Plan of Action on Incitement, which has a number of um, recommendations for, for the media, um, as well as the authoritative interpretation of UN human rights treaty bodies, most, mo most notably general recommendation number 35 of the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Um, but um, without going into those in too much depth, and, I, and I'll try to put the references and the links to these sources, the main ones at least, in um, the chat box after I have spoken, um, I'd like to spotlight the ways in which some of these UN bodies and processes um, and um, at the regional level Council of Europe bodies have um, looked at Serbia before I highlight the recommendations for um, um, media and media regulators um, in, the, in the main and um, last part of my uh, comments. So um, as part of the universal periodic review process of the Human Rights Council, the last time that Serbia was um, reviewed, um, and this is a peer review process, so other states scrutinizing the um, human rights record of, of Serbia, um, a number of states actually um, identified the need to address and combat particularly hate speech um, in the um, uh, media environment um, in, in Serbia. Um, states like Lebanon, Croatia, Kyrgyzstan, and Norway um, um, and um, one state, Tunisia, even identified the, the, the um, need to address um, discriminatory speech against foreigners and Roma, um, and also talk more generally of the importance of media freedom and pluralism and protection of journalists in that context of the universal periodic review. The um, key treaty body on racial discrimination, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, also in 2018, um, examined the situation of Serbia. And um, this is a committee of experts who deliver recommendations on particular states. They're independent, so that we're not talking about states giving recommendations to each other, but it is a, a body of experts. Um, and they stated, and I quote, that they were alarmed by um, reports of a rise in hate speech, including on the internet, against ethnic and ethno religious minorities and, and this next part um, drew my attention and the committee said that they were concerned by indications that hate speech remains underreported um, by journalists in in Serbia so even though these recommendations are mainly directed to the state nonetheless the media comes into view um, in terms of analyzing the context of human rights particularly freedom of expression and equality and the relationship between the two at this human rights body. Moving to the regional um, level, um, in a, a much more detailed and focused um, analysis of the environment in, in Serbia, um, around the same time, um, 2017, um, the European Commission on Racism and, uh, and Racial Intolerance, ECRI, um, delivered its fifth monitoring um, report on Serbia um, and highlighted a number of issues um, which reflected those um, identified at the international level, um, such as how media outlets continued to give coverage to hate speech from politicians, amplifying its effect um, um, and contributing to increasing tensions between ethnic groups in the region. Um, it also highlighted how media outlets are struggling to survive commercially following their privatization and the growing um, tabloidization of the uh, print media, which also contributes to the proliferation of inflammatory language and hate speech, according to this body. Um, and the body also highlighted that media outlets also reveal the ethnic background or religion of persons suspected of criminal offenses unnecessarily. Uh, contributing again to, to, to a, um, an environment of um, uh, discrimination. So um, 
ECRI um, delivered a number of recommendations and I would be curious to see from, from colleagues um, participating what the status of the implementation of these recommendations is. So ECRI recommended that Serbian authorities should um, initiate intensive training for journalists, um, which could be carried out, for example, by the Press Council or um, the Commissioner for the Protection of Equality, and also um, gave a number of um, recommendations around the independence of the red regulatory bodies um, uh, and the Press Council um, and um, the, um, the, the powers of these institutions to impose effective, proportionate and dissuasive sanctions, um, as well as publicize their decisions. So fast forwarding three years to the situation now, um, um, there remains, even though, as I said, there's a heightened interest in social media and the responsibilities of social media um, platforms, um, the, the legacy media, the traditional media, um, mainstream media, nevertheless, is uh, definitely part of the efforts of um, international and regional bodies um, in the field of human rights. Um, and one of them is the Council of Europe Committee on Combating Hate Speech, a uh, body in which um, I have um, served as a, as a co-rapporteur. And I thought that for the remainder of the presentation, what I would do is highlight a number of themes that are um, evident from the um, draft recommendation that um, um, is, is now uh, being considered. Um, and, um, and these... Uh, recommendations around the media actually draw from those um, other texts that I already mentioned, such as um, the Rabat Plan of Action on Incitement, General Recommendation um, Number 35 of the um, uh, Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, as well as other texts. And two other texts that I'd just like to highlight are the UN Detailed Guidance on um, on um, the UN's strategy and plan of action on hate speech from um, 2020. Um, and one um, which actually isn't referred to by the uh, Council of Europe um, um, draft text, but nonetheless, I think is relevant, um, um, especially in, in the circumstances. And that is the UN guidance note on COVID-19 related hate speech. As I said, I'll, I'll put links to this um, all in the chat box afterwards. So colleagues have reference points. Okay, so what are the key recommendations for the media? Um, what should um, national policymakers also be thinking about um, when it comes to um, the role of the media in addressing um, discrimination? Well, first of all, um, there should be, and there is, um, in, and, and there is reflected in these in these texts from um, authoritative human rights um, bodies the premise and foundation um, of freedom of expression. So there is, um, there should be an awareness that media journalists um, and other media actors should fulfill their public watchdog role um, in democratic societies, should contribute to public debate and um, should be allowed to, should enjoy the freedom to report on discrimination, on hatred and intolerance and be allowed to choose their reporting techniques, styles and medium. Um, this is really essential, and, and that is based on the role of journalists uh, and the ability of the media more generally to, to enjoy their media freedom, their independence and autonomy. Um, so that strong protection of freedom of expression has to be at the basis of any understanding of the responsibilities of the media in addressing um, discrimination. Um, the second principle um, around which recommendations should be um, advanced and implemented um, is, is the need for the media, media professionals, including journalists, um, not only to have the freedom of expression protected, but also for them to um, 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 themselves um, pay attention to respecting human rights in all their activities. Um, so um, simply because, um, you know, they have that, um, 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 right to exercise freedom of expression and have that freedom of the media. Um, it also um, comes with, um, as um, the European Convention says, responsibilities, um, a term which is often manipulated by authoritarian actors to crack down on the media. But I think it, it means that, you know, um, media organizations should, should respect um, uh, 
um, the rule of law, essentially. So beyond those sort of two basic um, aspects, um, there are a number of um, principles um, which the media and journalists um, should um, recognize. So international human rights law applies to um, states, uh, subjects of international law, but that doesn't mean that the international legal framework hasn't been interpreted as I suggested to um, encompass and recognize the role of um, the media and journalists in um, promoting a culture of tolerance and understanding. So um, the uh, Council, Council of Europe Committee of Ministers since 1997 has had um, a recommendation on exactly that, on the role of media and journalists um, in promoting a culture of tolerance and understanding. Um, and there's a particular um, responsibility of public service media, given their mandate to serve all sections of society and to enhance societal cohesion. Um, it's not only about not disseminating hate speech um, as part of their mission, but also to actively promote intergroup dialogue and understanding, and also the airing of content that portrays um, in a positive manner the diversity of the communities they serve. Um, uh, media organizations more generally um, uh, are encouraged to um, adhere to and develop self-regulatory standards um, to also uh, promote a culture of uh, tolerance and understanding. Um, and in doing so, for instance, implement um, training programs for, for journalists. Um, I think I'm on my fourth point in terms of the recommendations, um, um, and that is um, to have specific measures regarding the workforce. So media organizations should take concrete, specific and targeted steps to ins towards ensuring workforces are diverse and, include and inclusive, including in their um, editorial decision-making. Um, um, they should um, seek a multiplicity of sources and voices from different communities um, in their efforts to um, seek, receive, impart and disseminate information. Um, so um, that idea is about um, internal diversity and, and sources that are relied upon. Um, fifth, um, public service media must, um, as a vital source of information and diverse political opinions, um, must be independent um, from political or economic interference. So, in efforts to address um, discrimination, um, the media um, needs to be um, independent and needs to um, and there needs to be a pluralistic environment um, for the media, um, an awareness of the um, diversity of opinions as well as counter and alternative speech, um, um, and this can be done by offering or providing different groups in society with an opportunity to um, receive and impart information and exchange ideas. Uh, sixth, um, media and journalists should, in their efforts to um, provide reliable and, and accurate information, should themselves um, avoid uh, derogatory, stereotypical depiction of individuals, groups of communities, and give voice to groups in society. So this is really about not so much the internal makeup or the reliance on sources, it's really about the nature of the reporting itself. Um, this is a responsibility, so this is not a this is not an um, obligation, it's um, advanced through self-regulatory standards, but this is a, an ought, this is a, um, uh, a, 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 um, a responsibility around which there is consensus um, amongst um, um, human rights bodies as well as um, leading uh, media organizations. So journalists should be encouraged to bring hate speech incidents to the attention of the public, raise awareness of the harm caused by discrimination, hatred and negative stereotyping and stigmatization, um, and um, uh, provide um, reliable information um, around um, diverse groups and communities in society. They should also be alert to the dangers of proliferating prejudice and um, furthering negative stereotypes about groups um, and avoid unnecessary references to personal characteristics as um, identified 
um, by the um, third committee in relation to Serbia from uh, 2017. Um, um, in times of elections, um, this is something that we, we discussed in the um, committee um, context um, in the Council of Europe, the media should um, consider exposing in their coverage of misinformation, disinformation, propaganda, um, 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 the, um, the nature of um, such information, if it targets persons and groups on the grounds of their identity, including minority um, or other status, and um, therefore damaging um, intergroup relations. So there is a responsibility around uh, um, misinformation and disinformation, which is increasingly being recognized. Um, and seventh, um, when it comes to the regulators, there is an assumption of genuine independence of national regulatory authorities um, and self-regulatory bodies, and both should pay, play a positive role in addressing hate speech. Um, these bodies should be publicly accountable um, and, in, and transparent as well as independent. Um, and in the development of these, their policies, regulatory authorities in the um, broadcasting sector um, should implement concrete provisions to, com uh, to effectively combat hate speech um, and um, also to actively promote tolerance, pluralism and diversity of opinions. Um, um, and this is really in relation to this, the responsibilities of states. States should guarantee that um, audiovisual regulatory authorities are also independent um, uh, through rules and through measures enabling them to perform their functions effectively and, and efficiently. Um, so those are sort of the seven key principles, I think, um, in relation to um, the role of the media and responsibility of media and journalists in addressing uh, discrimination um, and with a specific focus on, on hate speech and discriminatory speech. Um, and before I finish, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, there have been discussions around the role of media on COVID-19 related hate speech. Um, so um, um, these are, are very similar to the um, uh, points that I already um, uh, raised. Um, but um, um, these, uh, for example, the detailed guidance, sorry, the guidance notes on COVID-19 related hate speech from the UN has three points on, um, on this issue. Um, and, sorry, excuse me, I'm just, just going to um, bring it up. Um, so I, I remind myself that um, the media are, um, urge to proactively and professionally report on COVID-19 related hate speech, misinformation, disinformation, and discrimination, whether it's by state or non-state actors. Um, um, there should be um, effective systems of self-regulation to ensure the right of correction or replies applied to address discriminatory reporting in the context of COVID-19. And the media should adhere to the highest ethical and professional standards around COVID-19. Um, accurately and without bias, using fact checking, avoiding stereotyping, and also, um, as was mentioned before, um, without unnecessarily referring to factors such as race, ethnicity, nationality, or religion. So um, I'm going to just leave it there in terms of my presentation, and I shall try to put um, some links into all the documents that I mentioned into the chat box so colleagues have them. So thanks very much for your attention, and I look forward to hearing the other um, speakers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Palmer. Uh, now we'll hear from Francesca Bonelli, UNHCR representative in the Republic of Serbia. Francesca, please take the speech. Dobar dan svima, dobar dan Mr. Funović and Zoran, uh, it's nice to see you again. Um, and it, many thanks for this opportunity that the Ministry of Culture is uh, providing to UNSCR as United Nations Agency for um, the protection of refugees all around the world. Uh, we are here in Serbia with a mandate of protection of refugees since 45 years. And um, we work very closely with journalists, with media, with social media, and for us, the media is essential to ensure the, the, the protection of refugees, the human rights of displaced people. I would like to share 
presentation on UNSCR work with the, the, the journalists and with the media overall. Uh, um, because for us, what we see, not only in Serbia, but um, in, uh, in the world overall, uh, we see an increase. Uh, is okay, the screening is uh, well uh, displayed. What we see in overall in the world is an increase, not only in Serbia, in Europe, but globally, of hate speech, discrimination towards uh, refugees and displaced people, and lack of ethics towards the, 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 the refugees' rights. So I would like to share with you some basic that probably you already know, but just to, um, to define the, the concept of refugees, that are people that are fleeing from conflict or persecution. They are defined and protected by international law. The 1951 convention, the state's signatories are binded to not only implement, but also to protect the international convention. And they cannot go back home because there is a persecution and there is their, their life are at risk. What we are seeing um, currently today in the media particularly is a mixing of the different groups that are all connected to movement, to migration generally. And there is often this um, intermerging and using uh, indifferently between migrants and, and refugees. So I wanted just to share with you the um, general categories of uh, different people that are of concern for UNSCR. Uh, migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, stateless, as internally displaced people. Uh, we, um, we work particularly with the refugees that are recognized from the law. Asylum seekers uh, are in the process of recognition with the protection. The statelessness and internally displaced people are people that could be internally in a country. They didn't cross the border. They didn't leave their homeland. And they are still in need of international protection. Migrants also are all categories that need to be respecting their human rights and treated with human rights but they are not binded by the international law, by international protection commitment from the states. And I would like to really make the difference here between refugees and migrants, uh, because often uh, we see these challenges of mixing in the population that often is also instigate more hate speech and discrimination towards particularly the most um, vulnerable categories of uh, displaced people. Refugees are crossing the international border and are binded by the international protection need. Migrants always, uh, and I stress this point, are always uh, in need of respect of human rights, but are person moving for reasons that are not included in the legal uh, uh, commitment of, of each state and of the society. Knowing this difference, uh, has an incredible uh, influence on really um, instigate the, the hate speech and uh, or limit it or uh, uh, calming down or controlling it. We have seen in Serbian as in the Western Balkan increase uh, after 2015 when there was the Western Balkan route, uh, an increased mixed movement between migrants and refugees. We have uh, every day arriving at the um, southern board in Preshevo, many people that are from Syria, from uh, Iraq, from Afghanistan, but we have also many people from other countries that are from Pakistan, Tunisia, and from other countries that they left and not for reason of uh, seeking protection and security, but just to, to look for a better life. And we see that there is an increased uh, xenophobic approach in the social media, in the public speech, in the attitude. We know that the, they have been patrolling, attacking refugees uh, um, in few uh, locations in Serbia with the, with the discrimination discourse, but also with an, uh, uh, an aggressivity that was also given by the fear that in Serbia there will be an invasion of uh, uh, refugees and, and migrants and uh, displaced people coming from outside the region. And 
this is very important. It's a challenging uh, situation, but at the moment in Serbia, we have between 6,500 and 7,000 uh, people that are all hosted in the, the majority are hosted in the centers uh, from the government and in a situation that is very manageable because the majority of them are in transit. And the total number of refugees that uh, decided to stay in Serbia is recognized by the law is 212. So when you see this number, and when you see that the, the fear sometimes in, in the hate speech, in the discrimination, that it looks like in also in the social media that there is a, an enormous number present in Serbia, but the fact is not. And the number is manageable, is the capacity of uh, from the civil society and from the authorities there. And we are together all with different actors, including the journalists, also providing uh, information and also countering the, the aid speech. This here we reach the highest uh, level of uh, displacement around the world. We reach the 82.4 million of displaced people. I will not go in details, but these 82 million are divided in various categories. As I mentioned before, there are internally displaced people, there are asylum seekers, and there are uh, more than 26 million of refugees. The majority of them is, is not hosted in Europe, is hosted in, in other countries, uh, in Africa, in Middle East, in Asia, in South America, where um, there is the majority. But often in Europe, and, um, and I see, I'm Italian, I see in Italy, but in other countries, also in Europe, there is a discourse and uh, instigating uh, this fear that there is an invasion in Italy. And actually this number, if we go uh, to see the, 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 I will share with you that this presentation that shows the here's uh, movement of the, an increase of the displacement uh, overall from the 2010, where there were 40 million, uh, um, in 10 years, we had 10 million more of displaced people, and the majority of them are in the South America with the Venezuelan situation, that they have more than 5.5 million of refugees, and the Syrian situation with more than 6 million internally displaced people and 6.5 million of refugees spread, particularly in the Middle East, in Turkey especially. So the fact and, and the, 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 the work really in passing this messaging is very important to control and to counter the hate speech, the discrimination and the increased risk of xenophobic approach. The 86% of the refugees are hosted, as I mentioned, in countries that are uh, underdeveloped and uh, neighboring, neighboring to Syria, neighboring to Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan and Iran, they have uh, the highest number of Afghan refugees since decades. And uh, with this increase, unfortunately, of conflict globally, we see the, the increased number of uh, also um, very vulnerable groups. And amongst these groups, I mentioned one specific, uh, that are the unaccompanied children. Globally, we reached more than 1 million of children born as a refugees, but the unaccompanied children is a specific group of categories. And in Serbia, we have uh, witnessing every day the arrival of uh, particularly boys from Afghanistan that they have 12, 15 years old, so they are adolescent. Mainly are uh, men, uh, boys traveling in groups. They have been uh, since uh, I would say the last years, uh, um, victim often of age speech, of attacks, of discrimination. While these are really categories of groups, they are persons, they are children that will need really the, the understanding, the human face and the, the protection from the civil societies and the authorities. And there are, in Serbia, as in other parts of Europe, there are the capacity and there are the system 
and the services for them to be um, protected, received, and treated. So they are in need, and, and they need this treatment, and they are not an invasion or a risk, or as often the hate speech is really portraying them as a, as a dangerous uh, um, invasion. And uh, just to mention that the, the 68 percent of the all refugees around the world are coming from uh, mainly five countries, Syria, as I mentioned, 6.7 million, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan and Myanmar. And the main countries that are hosting refugees all around the world are Turkey, with more than 3.5 million of refugees, particularly from Syria, but also from Afghanistan. Colombia, particularly with the Venezuelan after the, the, the 2018. Pakistan mm, host still now, after many decades, more than 1 million of Afghan refugees. Uganda received many refugees from Congo, from South Sudan, from Rwanda. And Germany at the moment is the only country in Europe that is uh, receiving more than a million of refugees. Because globally in Europe, we have the lowest number of refugees if we compare it uh, with the other continent. What is the role of the journalists and what is uh, the, the important influence that the journalists have uh, and media and social media particularly in countering the, the, the hate speech and discrimination and having a ethical uh, professional ethics in speaking about uh, uh, refugees and asylum seeker and displaced often they 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 are really a very um, important source of uh, direct information and it's very important to have the direct uh, speech with the refugees but it's also very important that uh, um, when we we speak with the refugees often uh, they are traumatized, they came from a very dangerous and difficult journey, and uh, it's a very important uh, and delicate uh, um, interview and intervention. So uh, also as a UNSCR, we are always and we closely work with the, with the journalists also to help them in preparing the interview with, uh, with refugees, particularly if they have uh, specific cases. And some of them, when they give the, the interview, they are not even aware of the some consequence that they can receive. For example, if they are seen and recognized, uh, they can be target of uh, also aid and aggression if they are recognized and if uh, a journalist, uh, for example, uh, mentioned their story. So often uh, we use uh, different name and um, and when there is a possibility, we always uh, help journalists to, to, to prepare, particularly in specific uh, cases. We have cultural mediator, and we have, uh, as UNSCR also, interpreter that can function also the, uh, of a good uh, um, preparation for the interview. And, uh, and it's very important always, uh, aside the consent, that is something that is a uh, basic uh, for the privacy and for the, the respect of the, 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 the refugee is always good to also in the pictures and in the video to use the, the, the angle but these are things that you are well aware and I, I don't uh, take your time on this and in general is really very important uh, um, I share here the, the, the our uh, information our um, link in social media where we can we share daily uh, information on uh, on um, uh, refugees activities and uh, refugee facts but i would like also to uh, to share with you this uh, guideline for journalists that uh, we prepared uh, exactly to just have a cooperation more closer and more um, uh, giving to journalists a few hints, a few suggestions how best uh, really contribute to an environment that is, uh, first of all, human and, and really portrayed the human face of refugees uh, and uh, giving uh, particularly the, 
the, the, the, the real fact, the, the data that are really countering very well the, the um, unbased fear and unbased aid towards refugees that are considered as invasors and uh, a huge number. And overall, as I will share uh, this with Yelena and uh, she will share with all of you if you are interested. Uh, but is uh, for us as UNSCR, we are really always available. And I repeat uh, the fact that we are um, extremely um, pleased to work uh, every day with journalists and committed to work more and more, particularly also on the social media, the, the Facebook and all the other channel that are very sometimes uh, uh, difficult to control for the hate speech. And we remain available to continue this discussion that is very important also to, to see how united we can counter the discrimination and the hate speech. I stop here and uh, I will be ready for a question if you have it later. Uh, thank you very much to all of you for listening and uh, thank you, Zoran. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, what follows is uh, Dr. Maha Bashri, Associate Professor of Communication, Department of Media and Creative Industries, the United Arab Emirates University. Please take the screen. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I have a presentation that I'd like to share. And just checking here that everybody can see my presentation. Yes? Okay. Okay, so I am going to be talking about or examining the role of the fourth estate um, journalism in a functioning democracy. Um, the role of a journalist or this freedom of expression comes with responsibilities and a mandate. Um, so we're going to move where we're going to look at the mechanisms, the journalistic practice mechanisms in theory and how that affects the production and dissemination of news from an editorial uh, perspective to an audience and the reaction or the uh, perspective of the audience. So as we all know that the media makes sense of the external world for us, um, there are 290 plus countries around the world. We're not gonna visit all of them. We visit through the screens on our um, TV stations. We visit through what we read in our newspapers. And nowadays we visit through what we see on uh, SNSs, which are social network sites. The media, as we all well know, is a watchdog that should guard democracy and ensure that um, all people are represented. And this is one of the main issues that we're seeing nowadays with um, the proliferation of hate speech, of uh, you know, lack of tolerance for the other and so forth. So it's vital that journalists have a clear understanding of um, the media's role and its relationship to what good governance is, what freedom of speech is, and what representations of the other is. And that will lead to um, cultural resonance. Sorry. So the first theoretical um, perspective that we should put or we should examine uh, from a journalistic perspective is framing. The uh, act or, you know, when, when we're practicing journalists, we need to have a reflexive inward look into how we report news. And framing is one of the first things or one of the first theories that comes to mind. And that is because there's just so much news going around, we have to, from an editorial perspective, organize the news content in a way that will um, supply some kind of context and suggest what the issue is to our audiences. Now, the way news is framed by a journalist um, is not necessarily uh, a bad thing, but we need to understand that it emphasizes a journalistic or editorial choice, and it depicts certain characteristics um, of issues and topics that we're covering. These media frames in turn can influence how audiences perceive the issues that are uh, being covered. And this is where the responsibility of the journalist comes into place. So news frames in media, as we said, construct meaning for audiences, um, be it uh, meaning when it comes to politics, to social issues, to geographic locations, to other people. 
And we need to understand that the construction of meaning does not occur as a result of one new story. It is a combination or amalgam of many news stories of an extended period of time. So as a journalist, I need to be cognizant of the fact that my coverage of an issue over the course of a period of time will set a media frame for the audiences that um, are going to be exposed to it. Now, these news stories um, create an overall discourse or what we call interpretive packages. And this is how audiences understand other people or topics that they don't necessarily see in their you know, everyday life, or perhaps they do affect their everyday life. So media frames are of great importance. We're not negating the fact that they're important because logistically they organize the work of a journalist from an editorial uh, perspective. But at the same time, they organize the um, issues and what is being covered or what is going to have the most focus when it comes to consume or consumption of the news. So this organization occurs as a result of, you know, three interrelated uh, processes, which is the cultural resonance. So the way I frame a story depends on how it culturally uh, impacts the group that I'm talking to. For example, um, we just heard um, that in Italy, people think that there is a migrant or a refugee problem, even though that's not happening. So it's a cultural resonance. It's what people really want to hear or what, what they want to think. Sponsor activity um, is who owns the message or who is paying for the message. And finally, the journalistic practice. And in our case as journalists, this is what we can control. So the issue with framing is that, um, Again, to organize the world uh, on the outside, um, journalists don't necessarily have all the time in the world. So we use what we call episodic news frames and that will focus on a specific event or issue without giving any attention to the relevant background uh, or information that will then enable the um, audiences to make up their own minds and to better understand the issue uh, that is being examined. And this is one of the major problems that we see. People will, you know, it's a superficial understanding of what's going on, but not necessarily any historical context uh, of why this is happening, um, what we can, you know, what the timeline, historical timeline looks like. And again, it's not because a journalist um, is intentionally uh, or has a, a do, doing this or has a sinister reason for doing this, but it's because of the editorial process and let's say if we're looking at you know, places where um, countries around the world, for example, like the US, where journalists are uh, reporting around a beat system, and that is you, know, you have to report quickly, you have deadlines, um, the story needs to be out by a certain uh, time frame, you are going to cover it as superficially as possible because you yourself don't have that background information. So the way an issue is presented in turn or frame affects how the public perceives it. Because I'm not giving them that context, again, as I said earlier, the public is going to have a superficial understanding of what's going on, and that's problematic for us. So going on um, you know, from the fact that we frame as, as journalists, um, we also need to understand that when we cover or we um, are writing about the other in the news media or in the press, it is necessary to understand that people are not made up of one characteristic or attribute. And this is what we call intersectionality. It's necessary if I'm writing a story, for example, about a refugee, about a migrant, even in societies, most societies around the world are not homogeneous anymore. Um, there's a lot of migration going on. There's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, intermarriages going on. It is necessary to examine the intersection of the other or the individual's combined attributes. And that is their race, their gender, their class, their religion, you know, all of these attributes come into play as to how this person should be represented in the news uh, media. So in most cases, when it comes to framing and when it comes to uh, press coverage, intersectionality examines identity through the axis of race. So 
that's from the journalistic perspective. Let's look at how frames then affect how audiences perceive the news and how they understand the news. Schema theory is used to explain how gender and racial minority stereotyping occurs in the minds of the audiences. So what we're saying here is that we as you know, uh, media consumers or as people who are exposed to uh, stories in the press, we will create cognitive structures or maps to organize knowledge about a given concept or you know, stimulus that we are exposed to from possibly previous experience. But as I said earlier, we don't necessarily experience or meet people from all walks of life. The news media makes sense of all of that for us. The media coverage helps us develop these schemas to better understand events, to better understand other people, to better understand politics, to better understand geographical locations, et cetera. So as we said earlier, the media makes sense of the external world for the audiences. Um, and this is where, again, our responsibility as journalists comes in because schemas are good. They help us or they help audiences to make sense of the deluge of information that they're exposed to. However, when we use or when we frame in a um, negative or overgeneralized and have tropes in our coverage, this in turn has an undesirable effect. And this we can see, I mean, there's a lot of research that supports this. This is, um, comes up time and time again in coverage related to race, to gender, um, to ethnicity, to our uh, uh, religious affiliation, which in turn might lead to negative stereotyping of the other or the minorities within a given society. So women and let's say minority candidates, if we're looking at politics, running for office, they tend to receive less media coverage and less respect from the public. And then again, that goes back to the negative media frames that their uh, audiences are exposed to. There is a dominant uh, stereotypical portrayal of women and minorities in the media, and that's across the world, not only, let's say, in uh, uh, Western societies or the first world. This research has shown time and time again is um, found in, you know, um, across the entire world. Stereotypical media coverage or the stereotypical media frames often strengthen stereotypes and help define what a society deems as appropriate or inappropriate behavior. So how, for example, you see a, uh, let's say, a Black person or how the media uh, reflects even the adjectives, the way language is used um, to, uh, write a story about, let's say somebody who is black or somebody who's brown, will affect how audiences who are in the majority perceive these people in real life when they meet them. So media plays a really important uh, role in identity and inclusion in the national fabric. Identity in the, in the nation state, in the uh, you know, modern nation state is constructed as a result of the interplay of what we call, um, of what we deem uh, four main types of interconnected forms of power, one of which is media. Media has a symbolic power in who belongs, who's in and who's out. Um, because it constructs reality, because it produces reality, and again, because it um, cements reality. And that goes back to what I had said earlier, that uh, media frames don't come from one story. They come from, uh, you know, stories over a historical period of time. It's a pattern or trend in how we cover um, topics and how we uh, cover other people. So in the processes of identity formation, the news media is really critical in uh, considering, um, its, considering its ability to symbolically produce certain ideas of the world and our place in it. And I will give an example. Um, if, uh, again, if we, let's say, let's use the US as an example. If we want to, um, media, like if you want to look at the coverage of Muslims, American Muslims in the United States, um, the first thing you would notice uh, in any story that you uh, 
actually pull up from the internet or from even you know elite media like the New York Times, the Washington Post, is the fact that if it's to say about a Muslim women, they're always wearing the hijab. There's nothing wrong with about wearing the hijab. Perhaps this is what a Muslim these Muslim women um, decide to wear, but there are American Muslim women who do not wear the hijab and do practice. They are practicing, but that stereotypical frame tends to stick, and in turn it. Uh, produces a certain idea of what an American um, Muslim woman should look like or looks like. So again, going back to this idea of media and the role it plays in inclusion, you, who's in and who's out when it comes to uh, national identity, it has the ability to form a common we. The we is the majority, the other or the minority are the others. So if you're in the in-group, you're part of the we, and this is how it's being framed. If you're not part of that we group, you're, you know, you're othered, you're part of the, the, the minority. Media messages and frames um, always tend to represent images uh, of different identity groups uh, within the fabric of a nation. So for example, you'll see, again, going back um, to the example I just gave a few minutes ago, uh, an American Muslim woman stereotypically in the media would look as someone who's wearing the hijab rather than somebody you know, wearing the hijab and going to a mosque. This is the picture that you more, more or less most of the time, this is what you're gonna be pulling up. While it doesn't have to be that way, we're not saying um, they're, they're not some who are like that, but there are also um, some who don't. And that, again, gives rise to who belongs and who doesn't belong. Because when it comes to one's mind, um, if you are a, an American, this is not the way you look. A woman wearing hijab most likely would be someone who belongs in the Middle East. So by default, using such media frames um, excludes this group of uh, citizens. So media reflects a constructed reality that determines how events, phenomena, and processes are conveyed to audiences. And again, this affects who belongs and who does not belong. Um, Western media, and I think this is, you know, we really need to take an inside look or a reflexive look at what, how Western media misrepresents minorities or the others. Um, they, there is a pattern now. They have distanced themselves from crude notions of biological inferiority of, you know, when it comes to race or to come, comes to ethnicity and so forth. But they instead forge linked, uh, links between race, nationhood, patriotism, and nationalism. So um, it's subtle. The frame is there. Um, it's not necessarily saying that somebody is less because of what they look like or what group they belong to. It's just a link that you form between, you know, from one story to the other, between who's in, who's out, who's part of this nation, who's not part of this nation, and what they look like. A simple picture can actually do that for you. So media is seen as a driver for national cohesion and identity in societies because, again, it constructs and defines who's in, who's out. It defines communities. It defines belonging. And again, media frames play a huge role in this. So when we talk about media and information literacy, um, we also need to um, bring into the conversation the news literacy education. The primary goal of media uh, literacy education, as we all well know, is to help people, to help students develop informed and critical understandings of what the media should be doing, of its nature, of its influence, and to critically analyze messages. Now, the theoretical definitions vary, depends on who's looking at what, but generally speaking, it is the ability to um, access, evaluate, analyze, and create media messages. When we talk about news literacy, which is a bit different, it's, an, it's a new way of looking at or labeling um, how news is put together, how we can analyze the news. It's a specialized category in media literacy that focuses exclusively on news and rests on the premise that news in itself plays an important role in democracy 
and news providers, therefore, news providers meaning the organizations, the editors, the journalists, they have a unique responsibility to inform self-governing citizens. So again, the burden is on the shoulders of those who produce the content. Um, now, this goes back to the fact that if we look at the fourth estate for journalism, uh, the frequent referencing is that journalism at its core is there to service the public interest, to inform the public. And then uh, the public can make up their mind as to where they want to go. Journalists are often depicted as watchdogs or advocates but they cannot be watchdogs or advocates if they don't understand how they themselves are recording the journalistic practices. So both these metaphors, uh, metaphors imply that journalists should operate on behalf of the public. But again, I go back and say they need to understand why they are reporting the way that they are reporting. Um, and then critics nowadays point to or Actually, you know, um, this has been a conversation that's been going on since like the 1970s to structural factors that affect or get into the way of, um, you know, this watchdog or advocate function of the media. Um, for example, um, journalists seemingly fail to fulfill their social mission because of the ownership of news organizations. That's big businesses owning um, you know, news organizations and therefore not carrying out the mandate of a responsible media that is out, uh, that is there, that has its main function is to inform um, the public. Now, we also need to understand that um, Journalistic practice, again, I go back to the journalists and how we can help them, um, you know, become better at what they do and fulfill their role in society. Um, journal journalistic practice and journalism education are closely intertwined. Um, Self-governing societies, okay, ones where we see a democracy, need what we call or what has been called an unlevel press, and that is a watchdog press that is unbiased. Um, even as the number of alternative information sources rise. We do see now that everybody is a producer. We have audiences, our audiences have become both um, consumers uh, of news, of information, but they also produce uh, information. But at the end of the day, the press is at the helm. And the best analogy I can use for this is, yes, you can self-medicate, you can use Google, to uh, look up uh, what symptoms you have and decide not to go to the doctor, but then it, you're on your own. The same applies to journalism and the function of what um, journalism does in society. You can produce your own news uh, and you can produce your own content, but it's the journalists who actually have the training and have the know-how of how to produce information that actually leads to a functioning democracy. Um, so an ethical, unbiased press requires, and this is, again, goes back to the fact that um, societies around the world are not, uh, you know, uh, formed of one ethnic group or, you know, one gender. We need diversity in the newsroom, and diversity comes in lots of uh, forms and shapes, diversity in gender, diversity in race, diversity in uh, religious background, diversity in political affiliation. Uh, we don't need echo chambers in how news or information is being, uh, you know, uh, reflected or written about. We need lifelong learning for journalists, especially with the uh, advent of new technologies, rapid you know, breakthroughs and rapid changes in technology. Journalists cannot, be, cannot afford to be static. They need that lifelong learning to be able to navigate the new landscape and new terrain that we're seeing. And most importantly, in my opinion, we need journalists who are willing to turn the lens inward and ask themselves, why am I reporting this way? Why am I framing the story that way? People need to be reflexive about their reporting. And I think the more um, attributes, I would like the more intersection in one's identity, I think um, a journalist might be more understanding of the other or might be better equipped 
to uh, actually cover the other. Again, as I said earlier, um, there's just so much going on now. People are moving because of this globalization all over the place. Um, we are not going to cover the entire world. We're not going to see people from each and every country, each and every walk of life, each and every ethnicity. But I think the more um, of a you know the more a journalist has when it comes to intersectional um, aspects in their identity, the more likely they are to. Uh, understand or have at least empathize more with the other, cover their story more from a, you know, human interest kind of uh, perspective. So journalism programs now need to emphasize these personal interpretation habits, you know, again, going back to why journalists uh, report the way they do, and also emphasize news theories and practices. It is not only about using the technologies, it's about understanding how these uh, theories manifest in our coverage of news. Approaches to news literacy must reflect that the public sphere um, was once dominated by these huge media organizations. Um, but what we're seeing now is that audiences are now both consumers and producers of information. That even though we do understand that jur the journalist has the mandate, but we also need to understand that everybody does have a megaphone on an SNS on Facebook, on Twitter, and they can uh, both produce and um, consume news. So we need to be aware of how to, again, navigate this uh, new terrain. So on a final uh, note, um, I think it's really important that we have instruction on news analysis, um, which is often part of media literacy education. And that should only be for people in like young people in the schools or older people who want to uh, gain these skills, but it's also important in the newsroom, given the importance of news to democracy. And I end by saying, uh, by reading this quote, that decisions made by the people in the voting booths are based on information made available to them. That information is uh, provided primarily by the news media, okay, by journalists, hence the news media are indispensable to the survival of democracy. It is a role of journalists to ensure that democracy survives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bashir. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Mr. Stephen Ward, media ethicist, author of The Invention of Journalism Ethics, The Fact, Objectivity, and Beyond. Stephen, please do take the speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to assume you can hear me and you see my slides and then I'll proceed. So, well, good morning, uh, at least for me. I'm talking to you from Canada and it's a, it's, a, it's a privilege to be with you. I once reported in former Yugoslavia as, as a Canadian reporter. Um, the, the, uh, my, my talk now that I see the others and I, I really enjoyed and agreed uh, with uh, what has been said, it's going to be more philosophical at a higher level. I'm going to, and, and so, that, because that's what I am. <laughs> I'm a philosopher and I do philosophy of journalism, but I think it, it will work. It's consistent with uh, the very interesting facts and points made previously. So let me begin. The future of democracy uh, where issues are debated by reasonable publics is in doubt. The project of ethics to create humane societies is under threat. And the future of our species is not assured. We live in a global world, but we think with the mindset of prehistory humans. Our norms are still biased towards kin, tribe. We are easy to adopt aggressive nationalism. From evolution, we inherited social traits such as empathy and cooperation, but also what I call Darwinian traits such as anger and tribalism. The question at any time is which traits will prevail. Can we design cultures and social spaces that trigger cooperation rather than aggression? And as you know, we have a new designer of culture and trigger of traits, global communication. Once hailed as a democratizer of media, we now endure a toxic media of misinformers, trolls, extremists, and unreasonable publics. Thus, a central task of ethics is intercultural education and dialogue with a twofold function. One, collective resistance against communicative violence. And two, the collective development of measures to promote egalitarian democracy 
worldwide. This is not the cue for another plaintive cry about the state of the world. It's my plea for pragmatism, for action, for global programs, for educational redesign, for teaching the critical evaluation and ethical use of media. You should ask what is our competence in the first place for intercultural communication? Can the us versus them become us with them? We need media spaces where we can meet the other in their differences, yet also as human, someone with whom we cooperate to address global problems. Preaching moral globalism from a pulpit or a lecture will not be enough. People in their daily lives need to be able to experience and practice being democratic, being tolerant, being reasonable. So we face a choice. Shall we construct reasonable or unreasonable publics? For much of history, mor moralities have been immoral, supporting war, pogroms, tyranny, unjust social hierarchy. Leaders, churches, and armies have used the strong language of morality to justify killing, enslaving, and demonizing. And whatever credibility this tribe-based approach to morality ever had was shattered in the 20th century by the bloodbath of two world wars, Holocaust, ethnic cleansing, and the gas chambers of concentration camps. Yet this moral parochialism persists. The only way out, it seems, is for humans to evolve a broader moral commitment that actually alters behavior. behavior. Will humans be able to do so? Frankly, I don't know, but we have to try. I will discuss some ways to strengthen the democratic and intercultural capacities of our media sphere. My main, my main point is that this will require a radical rethinking of media ethics. First, I do not limit media ethics to the ethical codes of professional journalism. The use of media, as you know, goes far beyond the walls of professional newsrooms. Problems of media are so large that they go beyond the capacity of professional journalism to fix by themselves. Professional journalism ethics is only part of a larger communication ethics, which should be part of a global humane ethics. Second, remember why we need to be radical. It is because we are living through a media revolution. It is remarkable how the issues and the very language of journalism has changed. Just look on this slide. I won't go through it, but just look at the language. Consider the issues and how different this uh, list would, would have looked, say, 20 years ago. We are in the middle of a difficult transition from a non-digital parochial ethics of media to a digital global ethics for everyone. Third, journalists need a new identity, a global moral persona. Journalism ethics was born a century ago or an entirely different media with norms such as neutrality and just the facts. In this view, the journalist has duties towards primarily their group, their nation, but not so much to other groups and not so much other nations. Canadian journalists serve Canadians, Serbian journalists serve Serbians. The code said little or nothing about the global impact of one's reports. And today, more than the 600 codes in the world still say very little, I know, uh, I've seen studies, about global norms for journalism. The codes were formulated for a different media sphere. And it seems the assumption was journalist duty apparently stops at his border, despite the global nature of media. And despite the fact that parochial journalism has a long history of being xenophobic and ultra nationalistic. Today, journalism and media ethics, I would propose should go global. Media users, especially journalists should see themselves and here I agree with the former speaker, force, first and foremost, as global responsible communicators. Journalists should be what I call cultural interpreters. They should create a bridge of understanding and cooperation, cooperation over the gaps between cultures rather than widen gaps. Their ethics should be based on global values. Well, what's that? Well, parochial values reflect my attachment to what is near and dear, given my ethnicity or my nationality. Global values are values that apply to humans as humans anywhere. I became a moral globalist reporting in fields of war where I recognize the misery and the grief of ordinary people far from my home, that there is a common humanity of shared needs and desires. And the flourishing of that humanity anywhere should be the ultimate goal of media communication. Global values include human rights, peace, helping people develop capacity for a decent life, the moral equality of all humans, and the use of media to foster decency, decent hope, uh, and humane society. 
you know, long ago, the, Stes the Stoics said humans live within several communities at the same time, local, ethnic, national, in empires, and now global. All have ethical weight. It's not a question that we want to eliminate one of these attachments, even if we could. But the question is, which one has priority when they conflict? Moral globalism, my moral globalism, I guess, says that where they conflict, global values trump parochial values. For journalists, it's about enlarging, enlarging your moral consciousness. If my country, Canada, is benefiting from unjust trading policies with African nations, perhaps robbing them of natural resources, then as a journalist, I have a duty, Canadian or not, to say so. Narrow patriotism be damned. If I cover a crucial climate change conference, I do not narrow down my reporting to just what is in it for my country. I ask what is in it for others and for the global community. When I report on a dispute, say between Canada and European country on who controls the Arctic, I embrace what I call global objectivity. That is, I use an international set of sources and perspectives. And I don't presume from the start that my story must be pro-Canadian. If I come across racist actions by Canadian soldiers in conflict, I will reveal it. And this is not as easy as it sounds. When I covered national, regional wars, nasty, regional wars in which Canadians were involved as peacemakers. Back home, I was called unpatriotic if my stories were in any way critical of that effort and people tried to get me fired. Also global media ethics means new approaches to the coverage of global issues. Yes, pandemics, but also climate change and immigration as we've heard. And we need to teach it all of this to our media students, our new ones, our new media students. So that media education is not just technology training but the acquiring of cultural knowledge about the world in which they will soon live and work. We need to put media in a manner, we need media, a media that is sensitive to the cultural spaces of our plural world. This means not seeing ethics as a list of absolute principles applied uniformly to any situation. Ethics should be an evolving adaptation to changing conditions. Ethics is not just content, but also about process and change. It is about discourse. What matters is the open manner by which we address our problems. I see ethics as the evolving project to facilitate cooperation and create human society. Ethics is about proposing, not dogmatically imposing, new practices and values through open-ended cross-border discourse. We become listening publics. We have never had so much communication media, never so much flows of data, never so much social media, never so much angry campaign but so little real communication. To see why cultural knowledge and an open ethics is crucial, let me use an example from my country. In Canada, we need to deal with our history. How should we report on our First Nations who endured the sordid history of native reservations and the legacy of genocidal school systems of forced integration? How does a multicultural nation like Canada achieve a balance between laws for all Canadians yet flexible on how First Nations deal with problems in their own communities. The same could be said about our coverage of the LGBTQ community in Halifax, the Sikh community in Vancouver, the French Canadian minority right here in New Brunswick, not far away. The, all of this means we have to ask, what is the role of media and journalism in this attempt at reconciliation? And the answer is the role is vast. We need education about the history that has gone on, through, through the media, of course. We need respectful media spaces where alternatives can be proposed, where reasonable publics can make informed judgments. We need schools and media to emphasize the comparative and historical study of cultures and religions. And we need citizens who choose to be reasonable to step up and redesign our media spaces. No amount of skill in how you can use media technology will create dialogic media. Some people have told me that the answer is go back in time. Go back to neutral journalism that reports on just the facts. Stop editorializing. But I think there's no going back. But media ethics does not have and needs. It's a philosophy of media engagement for democracy that is between neutrality and partisanship. I've called it objectively engaged journalism. It's basically journalists use the best methods to advance democratic impulses worldwide. In a world where facts are manufactured, 
where presidents undermine democracy, where states engage in information campaigns, where racists spread dangerous images on social media, and where really wacky theories weaken pandemic variation, including right here in Canada and around the world, journalists and citizens cannot be neutral. Reporters sh should not stand back from the fray and report what others are simply saying. This is the just the facts approach drilled into my head when I joined journalism. Instead, we are democratically engaged when we call out purveyors of fake facts, when we challenge public safety. Journalism today should not be stenography where all voices are treated equally. Objectively, objectivity does not mean that journalists cannot write that the president is a liar or a racist, if in fact he is. Objectivity does not mean you simply report the statements made by a racist speaker amplifying his voice without critically assessing his status and his statements. To be democratically engaged is not to be partisan or biased. It is to be attached to the very broad goal of democracy, yet committed to testing particular stories for bias. Journalism has always had goals and values. It's only a question of what values to embrace and how to embrace them. Even neutrality, I remind you, is a value choice for certain purposes. Now, I do not think that everything online is bad. There's a lot of good material online, although it gets lost amid the angry voices. The global media is democratic and humanitarian uses, but it will require collaborative, society-wide initiatives to rescue public media from trolls, neo-fascists, and racists. So I think we need what I call macro resistance. This means society needs to concern itself with three areas of activity as shown on the slide. Evaluate media, educate about media, and reform practice. Let me again take Canada as an example of what could be done if we collaborated. Various public agencies across the nation could form the Canadian Coalition for Media Excellence. It doesn't exist. We need to connect across many boundaries, linking academics, schools and media, librarians, media councils, NGOs with an interest in good media, such as those who monitor human rights abuses. They would combine resources to combat toxic media, hate speech, and misinformation. And the groups would operate highly visible websites and hubs in cities across Canada with links to other coalitions globally. <clears throat> Evaluation means that the coalition or a coalition, say in Vancouver, would review media content regularly, exposing unreliable sources and fake news, maintain a registry of reliable sources, create state of media reports. Another hub, say in Toronto, to bring the knowledge of academia to working journalists, such as creating practical guides for reporting. Harvard's Media Center, for example, offers an online guide called the Journalist's Resource for covering the latest hot issues, such as the four things you need to read before you report on this. Also, the center could employ the latest in story tracking. There are big data computer programs that can identify most stories circulating in a country on a given day. And the computer can be programmed to display the story's source, political perspective, the author, the source's reliability, the transparency about how it funds them, and so on. So this is the sort of technology that should be in the hands of every citizen. Under educate is helping citizens be critical evaluators of media, as the last speaker just talked about. Coalitions would lobby the education system to develop media literacy, media ethics, teaching in schools, starting at an early age. Topics would include, of course, how we use our media devices, how news gets created, cyberbullying, trolling, exchanging pornography. The co coalitions would develop teaching modules to be used not only in the classroom, but could be used in workshops organized by civic groups. This cannot wait until college, and it should not be seen as an add-on to the curriculum. The best defense against, against misinformation is self-defense through critical skills. Now, coalitions against such things as hate speech I'm aware, exist in Europe as on this slide, but not so much in North America. Yet there is work on media democracy systems and news literacy around the world, and the UN has produced teaching modules for global media ethics. Under reform, I include creating new guidelines and protocols. We need, uh, in three areas, for example, guides for new media technology, like how do we use virtual reality, this new thing called automated journalism, computers writing, uh, writing stories. The media's use of drones and privacy issues and so on. We need guidelines on covering hate speech and demagogy. But also under reform, I would include changing the shape of media accountability or how media answer to the public. Since its origin, 
Modern media ethics has been a creature of professional media. Professionals develop the codes. Profession, professionals revise the codes until recently it was done within newsrooms entirely or within journalism as society. Media councils were until recently professionally funded and operated. Media ethics was a professional form of self-regulation and public participation in it all was not very robust. So I think we should develop a public participatory approach. Put simply, to seek out ways for the public to participate directly and meaningfully in the evaluation of media systems. We use global and social media to make participation in real time, inclusive and constructive. Public participatory ethics is a duet of ideas. First, media ethics is both a right and a responsibility of all citizens, not just the mainstream media or government regulators. Second, Media ethics should be collective advocacy for a reliable, diversely owned media which fulfills key informational functions and promotes democracy. How would the public be involved? There are many ways. People gather could gather virtually in town hall meetings, on social media, through citizen assemblies where they spend a weekend getting up to date on an issue aided by scholars and journalists. The aim would be to arrive at recommendations on some media policy. Also, communication media can be used to allow public participation in the work of media councils. Why enlarge participation? Because media content is produced by the public, because citizens have a right to be involved, because the record of mainstream support for ethics is checkered and undependable, because journalists by themselves cannot fix the structural issues alone, and because we live in an age that expects interactivity. Any system of, of accountability or any code revision which is not highly participatory from the start to the finish, the lack credibility when it's released to the public. Allow me to end with some good news. There is some good collaborative work out there being done. The Ethical Journalist Network in London gathers journalists from around the world, gets them together, and they develop norms for their problems, terrorism, hate speech, immigration, whatever. Happily, the idea of collaboration between journalism and other social actors is becoming more popular. Multiple news outlets, for example, worked on the Facebook papers recently in the news. There were so many new collaborative products and projects, uh, I couldn't get them all on one side, uh, slide, as you can see uh, from the slide you're looking at. Let me take another example. In Canada, the CBC partnered with The Guardian in London and the investigative reporting project in Italy to reveal that Canadian grocery stores were selling tomato sauces harvested by Uyghurs under oppressive conditions in China. One more example, the Canadian Journalism Forum recently produced a useful handbook that sits, uh, <clears throat> uh, that journalists can use when reporting on mental illness and trauma. It says, I have suffered some trauma from my war reporting this is the topic of Ms. Lawson. It sits on the desk of many reporters. It was put together with the help of what? Coalitions, <laughs> Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, health organizations, activists, and governments. So my aim has been to plant the following ideas in your mind. The meme of global media ethics and the meme of publicly directed ethics systems. Plus one final idea, we can change things, refuse to despair or just to shrug. We are part of the media system. Democratic digital citizens are not powerless if they act smartly in common cause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Uh, now we're joined with, uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Valerie Friedland, Professor of Sociolinguistic and former di uh, Director of Graduate Studies at the University of Nevada, Nevada in Reno. Uh, so if I, if I can see you just for a second, yes. Uh, yes, 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 I, I can see you can, you can take the, you can take the screen. I'm just not going to ask Stephen Ward just to mute himself. And Valerie to unmute. No, still, we can still hear you, Stephen. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, that's great. That's okay, great. 
Wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be on this panel. I found the other talks very interesting. And a lot of what I'm going to say today will actually dovetail really nicely with what's been said before. Um, as a sociolinguist, someone who works with language and culture, I'm going to focus a little more specifically on linguistic bias and, and sort of how small acts linguistically can um, have a very large impact in disseminating stereotypes and um, in the representation of, of people that we don't find the dominant or mainstream groups necessarily viewing favorably. I wanted to start today though by thinking about how we come into language as children because this is really important in how we view language later on. Um, when we're children, we not, we're not just learning the words of our language, the sounds of our language, the syntactic structure of our language, of the, although all of us can remember those days in class learning our nouns and word prepositions, but we actually also learn a lot of associated social beliefs and social preferences that the adults around us hold with language. Um, and for those of us that work with language, um, which is most of us here, I believe, these beliefs and social preferences that we're indoctrinated into very, very young are very unconscious by the time we reach adulthood, but they play a big role in perpetuating stereotypes and bias particularly in the language choices that we make as we continue through our lives, um, however type, whatever type of employment that might be, and just in how we talk to each other. So I wanted to first get the larger picture of how language impacts the way we think about other people's language. And in linguistics, we call this language ideology. And language ideology are simply the beliefs that we have about language and dialect speakers. So who speaks a language, for example, versus who speaks a, dial a dialect. There's no hard and fast definition. It's really based on an ideology that we're indoctrinated into when we're young children. There is no such thing as a single language speaker. For example, I'm an American English speaker, but I speak a dialect of American English just like everybody else. What happens though, is we are indoctrinated into these values of what is a proper language speaker, um, what, who speaks good English, who speaks bad English. And these become the normal or the preferred dialects and then become known as the language. This is not something that is based on any inherent value of any particular language or dialect, but it's actually informed by mainstream dominant ideas about race, about nation, about gender. Uh, who we think speaks proper English is really much tied to the social, historical, and political facts of how our countries get forged um, and our background experience. So the types of language ideologies that become very important as we age are ideas about correctness. Um, and these are things like who speaks a standard language, what constitutes a standard language, and this idea that there should be prescription. People are very tied to the fact that there should be one way to do things, like you don't end a sentence with a preposition, um, and using multiple negation is bad, using single negation is good. Although if you step back and look at it, the reason that we have the standards we do and the reason that we have prescription is actually tied to a really interesting growth of um, the need to establish English as a language of culture, of education, of institutions in the 18th century, because for a thousand years prior to that, English was the language of the common man. It was the language of the peasants. It was not considered an elite um, normative language. And it was during the 18th century in our history in Britain, where we started to find dictionaries and grammar books written to elevate English to be a language of institutional importance. So it's really a social, historical, political accident that the East Midland dialect became the standard as we speak it today, because London was basically the seat of power at the time. So it was fairly arbitrary. And yet now we've become so distant from that past. We're so separated from the social and political and historical facts that established it, that we no longer view this as anything but just the way it should be. Um, we also have strong feelings about appropriateness, and this is uh, the type of idea about who should be talking and where. So in workplaces, what kind of talk is preferred, and who do we expect to be talking more than others? And this is often when gender and race come into play. And this actually drills down into very specific ideas about linguistic forms themselves. So this is things like uh, glottal stop sounds uneducated or low class, and that would be something like ba'a versus butter. 
uh, and multiple negation is incorrect, even though historically multiple negation was actually the standard form, if there was even a, a notion of standardness in the 13th and 14th centuries. So things change, but we don't remember that. And this belief, these beliefs about what to write lead us to have this sense of perceived objectivity. And, and this idea of norming, this idea that this is the way things are, and these are the norms by which everybody else should be evaluated actually allows us to devalue other speech when it doesn't match these ideas that we hold that we've been indoctrinated into very young. And this is really the root of a lot of our stereotypes and bias about language. So how does this happen? How does this get transmitted? Um, well, there's a huge role of the media in this as well as education and political institutions because there are several different types of tendencies that we see from a sort of step back large picture in terms of how we approach language and the way that we talk about objects and things. And I wanna talk about the more general processes first, and then we're gonna drill down into specific ways this is accomplished through language, especially in media reports. So one area um, is known as linguistic markedness. And this is the idea that when something is treated as a norm in a culture, we don't tend to mark it with language in any way. Um, so an idea that we can look at in common language like this would be something like when someone names children, uh, they might name them Paul as a boy, but in order to use that name for a girl, you don't get a Paul, you get a Paulette, which is a linguistic marking of something exceptional or non-normative or different. Same thing with actor versus actress. Um, our bachelors are what we expect, and there's a lot of positive connotations with that, but if you're a bachelorette, not only do you have a diminutive uh, attached to you, which sets you out in a way as being exceptional, but there's also a negative um, sort of image of, of what bachelorettes are compared to bachelors. Same thing with masters versus mistresses. Again, the master is the norm. The mistress has an additional ending on it that marks it linguistically as something separate. And when you mark something separately and something differently, it actually sets that out for extra notice. Um, now, sometimes it's just a matter of a morphological ending like that, that how we mark sort of non normativity or something being atypical or unusual. But a lot of times, especially in media reports, we'll see stories that describe people differently. And they set a, apart the normal from the atypical or not normal. One example of this would be describing women in stories more often as career women. We often don't see men described as career men when we talk about them in stories. Uh, it's also the case where we mark ethnicity or nationality when we talk about someone who's doing a job that's sort of exceptional for not being a white male. Um, so you often hear something like it was a lady doctor or a black doctor. Uh, or thing, it can work in the other way where we mark things on men that are not considered typical, also reifying the stereotype of that typicality. And that's something like saying that men are family oriented. It could also be things in sports, for example, um, on a wrestling team, the ideological associations we might have with wrestling would be predominantly male. Therefore, it's normative to be male. If you just talk about wrestling, you might just say the wrestler. There's no effort made to mark that as a male wrestler, even though there can be female wrestlers. But if there was a female wrestler, they would be attached with the term female. So this is the idea of linguistic marketness. And we'll talk in a little bit about how this comes out in specific ways that can be very detrimental from a stereotype formation perspective. Another idea that we need to think about is simply visibility. Who gets seen the most in news stories? And what we find, and I think someone earlier mentioned this, women and minorities are less frequently covered in the news. They don't make up the objects of stories, the topics of stories. They're just not as visible in news stories as men are. And in fact, when we look across 108 countries' news media reports, we find that women were actually only about 24% of the people that were talked about in those news stories. What's really interesting is while the overall coverage is much less, guess, guess who is getting more negative coverage? It tends to be women minorities. So for example, when Hillary Clinton was running against Donald Trump in the US presidential election a few years ago, the scandals that she was involved in regarding the email server got four times more newsprint than all of Donald Trump's scandals combined. And of those, there were many. So the coverage tends to be more salacious when it is involving women and minorities, even though proportionally it's less frequent overall. Another thing we often don't think about 
when we're doing a story or when we're reading a story is whose view is represented there. So when we are going to get sources, which basically all good report, reporters are taught to do, who are we quoting more often as sources? Now, there was an interesting study on bias in the US news media that found that surveying news covered from mainstream media and also including Fox News, that the mainstream media tend to cite liberal leaning think tanks and experts much more than conservative ones. And this has the end result of providing an ideological framing that happens to lean left. Um, and just when we look at who's uh, acting as an expert or a talking head, we also find that we tend to have more liberal leaning talking heads, um, but women minorities are much less frequently either the people doing the questioning or being questioned. So we also don't find much visibility for them in sourcing, in sourcing either. So as reporters, consultants, and experts, we just don't see women and minorities very often either. So these are sort of um, large scale ways in which we transmit the idea that women and minorities are simply not as important in language. How are we doing this in more specific ways? How do we frame these people when they are in stories, when we are talking about them in conversations? What specific words are we choosing that have an underlying bias or types of descriptions of their characters that might influence what types of stereotypes are activated? When we look at studies that look at how people are described in stories, we find that there are ways that certain linguistic choices can influence the perception people take away and the stereotypes that are activated. One really interesting way this happens, and I think one of the earlier speakers mentioned it, is that sometimes the adjectives we choose activate certain cultural stereotypes we hold. And what we find is it tends to be when these adjectives are inconsistent with the stereotypes, that they have the most cognitive effects. So in other words, we trigger people's underlying stereotypes when we do things, we mention things that are inconsistent with the expectations we have for behaviors of certain social groups. One good example of this that we find a lot in American media is when successful African-American leaders, business leaders, political leaders are described as well-spoken or articulate. In comparing how a successful white business leaders or politicians are described, we find that they tend to be described in ways that reference the underlying stereotype with that contains the expectation that African-Americans speak African-American vernacular English or don't speak correctly. And by saying someone is well-spoken or articulate, what we articulate, what we're actually doing is activating that cultural stereotype. And in fact, studies show that that is indeed what happens. Another example is when um, Hillary Clinton was described as a nasty woman by Donald Trump, and this got lots of press. Well, the reason that is a particularly gendered insult is because the idea of nasty is inconsistent with the ideas that we have about womanhood. And therefore, it becomes an even more powerful statement about how she was outside the norm or exceptionally different. Um, another way is simply the way we call people. Uh, women, it turns out, are much more likely in stories to be referred to by their first names in subsequent mentions compared to men. Uh, we also find in sports reporting, this is particularly the case. And not only that, but they're often referred to as girls when Male athletes are never referred to as boys. So this has the effect of subordinating women and their position socioculturally and also treating them as more childlike. And finally, another way that we, we tend to see people written about in ways that activate stereotypic expectation is the other words that it co-occur with particular gendered or minority-based language. So for example, when we look across the British National Corpus, which is a corpus that consists of a lot of media reports, conversations, all sorts of uh, years and years of data, we find if we look at what the word man co-allocates with or the other words that tend to cluster near it, it more often occurs with verbs that are talking about action and strength. It also, um, we find more qualities described that refer to dominance or rationality or intelligence. And a lot of adjectives that describe their physical body or their physical size or their strength. Um, these would be things like hoisted or slammed as the action words, um, powerful as adjectives um, uh, that denote their dominance, uh, or things like burly or tall that denote their physical size. These are the types of words that tend to, to occur more often. In contrast, we find that woman occurred more with terms 
that we would expect to be associated stereotypically with women, things about emotionality, she was crying, she was teary-eyed, subordination, she was overcome, and physical weakness, she had a petite frame, she was delicate, those kinds of words. So what happens is maybe in one sentence, it doesn't seem so powerful, but when you look across a corpus of, of millions of words and you find these consistently reoccurring in these patterns, it reinforces and establishes the very stereotypes that we often are hoping uh, we're well past, but our language subtly re-invokes them. What's really fascinating is it's not just the meaning of words that we seem to be able to reify these stereotypes with and have some sort of underlying bias emerge, but it's also how we use these words in sentences. So the grammatical choices that we make actually are really powerful in um, reinforcing social bias. One interesting study looked at the use of nouns versus adjectives in a false news story about um, a unsportsmanlike behavior at a football, international football match. And what they found is when they described the offending player using a noun to denote his nationality, and I think it was a German in this case, so he was called um, the defending German it actually increased the category salience of him being an outgroup member nationally. And it elicited more polarizing statements of pro-nationality affiliation. People also felt his behavior was much worse when he was described using a noun versus using an adjective. So I think the contrast was the defending German versus the German defender. So that very subtle shift in whether you use a noun or an adjective actually shapes the essentialist assumptions that are evoked about that person, making it much more strongly um, separating and polarizing and dichotomizing when you use a noun versus an adjective. And this was one specific study, but it actually was based on a number of other studies that have suggested that using nouns increases essentialist behavior versus using adjectives. Another interesting way that grammatical choices can change the way we think about people and their actions and their behaviors is whether we put them in subject or object positions. So if you think back to grade school when you were learning about what subjects do and what objects do in those fun days, we, if you can remember, we think about subjects as the doer of the verbal action. In linguistics, we call this the agent role. Well, objects are the things that are described by the verb or acted upon by the verb the verb or receive the verbal action. So we find that subjects are active and objects are passive. What's really interesting is when you look over corpora data, which again is millions and millions of lines of text, we find that man, the word man and men occur more often in subjects position. Um, and this happens, this was actually looked at in news reports. While women or woman more often occur in object position. Again, what this does is very subtly encourage a view of the world where men are doers, men are agents, and women are passive. And another really interesting study looked at the use of definitive and demonstrative articles. These are things like the or that in English and found that when we choose to use definitive articles when we're talking about nouns, particularly plural nouns, it seems to highlight those people talked about as being members of an out group rather than an in group. So this would be an example of saying the Jews versus the Jewish people, or when we talk about the Americans did X versus Americans do X. If you just think about how those sound, you can see that when I say someone is the whatever, it's actually establishing a distance um, in our relationship so that I'm outside that person's group. And this seems to subtly suggest an orientation that we should have towards that person. So writers or organizations often don't think about how the language that they're selecting might serve to mark their affiliation or their orientation to the objects and the subjects they're writing about. Um, and last, before I finish, I also wanted to mention that it's not simply about who we talk about or how we talk about them that's important. It's not only who we're writing about and how we depict them that's important. It's what we're doing at home in our own spots, in our own workplaces. And whether this is a, a newsroom or a boardroom or a classroom, bias is actually everywhere in the way that we speak with each other. Um, so just as a quick example, I wanted to talk briefly about turn-taking. Um, think back to your last meeting. Who did most of the talking? How long did they talk for? And how did turns that talk get distributed? How were they selected? And who seemed to select them the most often? 
a lot of times when we're sitting in a meeting, we may not notice this, right? We're too busy doodling or doing whatever or checking email. But if you actually do studies on how turn-taking is distributed, and turn-taking simply means how we take different turns at talk when we're in a conversation, how it gets determined and who speaks for how long. We find that there's actually a lot of institutional and social power behind who gets more turns at talk and how long they talk for. And it turns out that certain types of people, certain memberships tend to talk more and dominate compared to others. Now, a lot of times this is related to qualities of, of um, gender or nation or race um, that determine who has the power to determine who gets to talk. So we find that, for example, in workplaces, if we look at meeting turn distribution, women by and large have many fewer turns at talk than men do. They tend to also be interrupted more often. And when they do talk, they tend to be characterized as bossy more often. A really fascinating study looked at this in the US Supreme Court and found that this pattern is indeed true there as well. And it actually, the study made a change in how they heard oral arguments to try to equalize that distribution. We also find this can be culturally based. So different norms for silence and how much silence is appropriate between turns can influence how people take those turns at talk. So for example, Americans tend to have a very little low threshold for silence um, between turns, whereas Finns and Japanese are known to like more silence as what's appropriate between turns at talk. So in cross-cultural communication, guess who's talking the most? Americans tend to hog the floor, which makes Finns and Japanese feel over-talked to and like they didn't get a word in edgewise. So a lot of times we find that what we think is relatively arbitrary is actually very much tied to the dominance of certain groups in a particular context over others. And even though it's unintentional a lot of the times, this type of inequitable turn-taking actually positions some people to be giving their views and their vantage points at the expense of others. Uh, and that's really it. I just wanted to, to thank you again for having me here. And I'm very interested in hearing the questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you a lot. It was quite, quite useful. And uh, finally, uh, we will hear the pre-recorded presentation of Bran from Brankit Sijankovic, Commissioner for Gender Equality of the Republic of Serbia. Etika i vrednosti u digitalnom dobu je sigurno jedna od najvažnijih tema kojom treba da se bavimo i zbog toga se zahvaljujem na pozivu i pozdravljam sve učestnike današnjeg događaja, jer je neophodno da razgovaramo o medijskoj i informacijonoj pismenosti kako bismo uspešno savladali sve izazove današnjice, pa možda je najbolje reći da se, Boga mi, teško može živeti bez adekvatne medijske pismenosti, a pitanje vrednosti je naravno najbitnije za jedno društvo i možda nije nikada bilo bitnije pričati o tome šta su naše današnje vrednosti zbog toga što Živimo u jednom dobu poljuljanih vrednosti i vremenu kada svi ljudi, ali naročito mladi, postavljaju sebi pitanje identiteta i možda prvi put u dobu kada zapravo negde imamo dva identiteta. Ta jedan digitalni, često ljudi nemaju svi, ali imaju svoje digitalne identitete i ove i naše sobstvene identitete i često su oni u raskoraku. Ali naravno nisam u mogućnosti zbog vremena, ali i naravno pozicije zbog koje sam pozvana na ovaj događaj da uđem u jednu dublju filozofsku raskrabu, mada eto, prilike da o tome razgovaramo na nekim drugim platformama, jer danas moramo da razgovarati zapravo o medijima, a mediji danas imaju moć i da informišu, ali i da usmeravaju i oblikuju i da formiraju javno mišljenje, a time i našu stvarnost. Bilo bi dobro kada bismo došli, ali naravno nisu mediji jedini odgovorni za tu našu stvarnost, a kada bi došli do te faze našeg društvenog razvoja da u medijima ne dobijaju prosto ljudi koji 
slobodu medija zloupotrebljavaju i slobodu govora zloupotrebljavaju kako bi izvršili diskriminaciju i uglavnom govor mržnje ili uznemiravajuće i ponižavajuće postupanje prema drugom, a sve to pravdajući slobodom govora. Po tim se ne podrazumevaju samo tekstovi koji obiluju današnji mediji, ima već i naslovne strane, fotografije, sadržaj i komentari na društvenim mrežama koji mogu da postiču mržnju, nasilje, mržnju, pa u krajnjem slučaju i nasilje ili da kažem ukratko sloboda govora je jasno odvojena od govora mržnje i zbog toga novinari jesu naš prozor u svet, ali taj prozor se nekad može ne samo otvoriti, već se može i zatvoriti putem medija onda kada oni ne poštuju sobstveni kodeks. U toj borbi protiv diskriminatornog govora, ali i borbi za tolerantno i demokratsko društvo, vrlo značajno i zapravo razumevanje digitalnih i informacijonih sistema, značajnu ulogu ima i poverenih za zaštitu ravnopravnosti, koja ima nekoliko zakonskih instrumenta da na određeni način utiče na prevenciju diskriminacije, ali naravno i njenu osobu kada se ono u javnosti pojavi, a to su tri naša oblašćenja, upozorenje javnosti u slučajevima teških i teške ili česte diskriminacije, tipične teške i čestih slučajeva diskriminacije, kako kaže zakon o zabrani diskriminacije, koja između ostalog zabranjuje sve vrste i oblike diskriminacije, pa i govor mržnje. Dalje, saopštenja koja koristimo da saopštimo povodom obeležavanja međunarodnih ili nacionalnih dana povodom određenih događaja, recimo poput Međunarodnog dana deteta, Međunarodnog dana tolerancije, Međunarodnog dana starijih, Međunarodnog dana borbe protiv fašizma i da ne nabrajam naravno sve dane i obaveštenje javnosti kada neko ne postupi po našoj preporuci na koje smo ovlašćeni zakonom. Osvrnut ću se samo na nekoliko naših upozorenja, jer nekako je javnost možda najčešće imala prilike, dakle naše građani i građanke, da čuju o instituciji upravo putem naših upozorenja kada smo reagovali na teške, uglavnom teške ili česte slučajeve ili nešto što je tipično, evo samo nekoliko poslednjih, evo recimo reklamna kampanja privredne komore Srbije kojom se promovišu domaći proizvodi je zaista nešto što je za pohvalu, jer domaće proizvode valja promovisati, ali ne na način kako je urađen u spotu, jer je reklama obilovala seksističkim govorom, dakle nije znači samo govor, to može biti i znak, i reklama, i i brojni drugi izrazi, jer su žene bile svedene na objekat i na taj način se vređalo njihovo dostojanstvo, jer ako se sećate, bile su prikazivene obnažene žene po kojima teče med i mleko i oskudno obučena mlada žena na motokultivatoru. Mislim, nisu ni muškarci prikazani u boljem kontekstu, ali ipak se svakako radilo više o ženama. Zatim, recimo, karikatura u nedeljniku Ninu u kontekstu slučaja dugogodišnjeg seksualnog nasilja u Beogradskoj školi glume koja je bila neumesna i ugradiva na više nivoa zato što silovanje, polno uznemiravanje i sva ostala krivična dela protiv polne slobode su pre svega krivična dela i ozbiljan društveni problem i nikako ne treba da budu predmet humora niti stavljanja u bilo kakav satiričan ili sarkastičan kontekst. Da ne bih više navodila, reagovali smo u brojnim slučajevima diskriminatornog govora i uradljivih komentara od novinarki i političarki, bez obzira da li se nalaze u vladajućoj stranci ili u opozicijonim strankama. Reagovali smo recimo u slučajevima uvreda predsednice Narodne skupštine, gospođe Maja Gojković, zatim premijerke Brnabić, predsednice podpredsednice Demokratske stranke Zagane Rakić, na početku pandemije 
tačnije vanredne situacije, račun, uvrede na račun članice tada, samo članice priznog štata, kasnije i ministarke Darije Kisiće Tepavčević, novinarke Tinka, novinarke RTS-a, novinarke N1 i dakle da ne nabrajam sve slučajeve. I ovo mi je prilike da možda dodam da su nekad očekivanja upravo zbog toga što su videli naše reakcije u javnosti, očekivanja javnosti različitih zainteresovanih društvenih aktera i onih političkih prevazila za naše nadležnosti, jer ja imam običaj da kažem da sam poverenica za zaštitu od diskriminacije i za ravnopravnost, a ne za nekulturu i primitivizam koji mobiluje naša javna scena ponekada. I takođe nisu redke situacije u kojima smo mi jedini koji reagujemo, iako je trebalo da reaguju druga regulatorna tela poput REMA ili Saveta za štampu. To je recimo skori primer emisije televizije HEPI u kojoj su astrolozi, numerolozi i grafolozi tumačili natalne karte i sudbinske brojeve Milene Radulović i Miroslova. Aleksić je u vezi sa prijavljenim slučajem seksualnog nasilja, što je predstavljalo nedopustivo ponižavanje i snevanje žene koja je prijavila nasilje, u krajem slučaju izrugivanje ovoj vrlo važnoj temi. Inače, kada je u pitanju izveštavanja o nasilju nad ženama, i dalje nisu redki slučajevi da se krši novinarski kodeks i vređa dostojanstvo žrtve, da li namerno ili ne, to nije važno, jer kod nas preovlađuje stav da je to porodična stvar, komštijska stvar, u kojoj se ne treba mešati, a žrtva ne bi dobila batine da je ćutala. Dakle, to imate često priliku da negde provejava u tom kontekstu bolje nego što je bilo, ali pre nekog vremena sam govorila na jednoj konferenciji posvećenoj upravo o ovoj temi, pa sam gledala medijske objave koje su nam stizale u press clippingu i evo samo nekoliko naslova. Usmrtio ženu jer je htjela da ga ostavi, zapalio ženu jer je imala švalera, upucao konobaricu zbog neuzvraćene ljubavi. Sve ovo pokazuje da pojedini medije i dalje indirektno na neki način opravdavaju zločin njegovom relativizacijom. Recimo, bivalo i tekstova, evo tekst kad stan ima zadak starosti, kojim se grubo malovažavaju najstariji građani i vređe njihovo dostojanstvo, jer je na jedan nedopustiv i krajnje uvredni način problematizovana higijena, odevanje, iskrana i stil života najstarijih sugrađana i bilo je i preporuka kako se rešiti tog zadaka starosti u stanovima Jer svi ovi stereotipi zapravo ne samo da su diskriminatorni, već dodatno stigmatizuju i stvaraju netrpeljivost prema najstarijim građanima. Bivalo je situacija gde se nije vodilo računa o deci, pa smo reagovali na naslovne strane Srpskog telegrafa, teksta na portalu Alors, u kojima su prenete izjave upapšenog otmičara 12-godišnje devojčice, čime su pređene s te granice profesionalne etike i prekršena prava deteta, jer su objavljivani detalji ovog gnusnog zlodela koja nije informacija od javnog značaja, već zloupotreba medijskog prostora i kršenja kodeksa novinara Srbije. Pored, naravno, ovih naših zakonskih povlašćenja, spravodimo i brojne aktivnosti. Navešću samo dve, recimo, važne. Prvo, u toku je regionalni projekat Evropske unije i Saveta Evrope u kome učestvujemo kao institucija i u okviru kojeg smo pre nekoliko meseci kreirali i predstavili istraživanje o istraživanje i izveštaju upotrebi govora mržnje u medijima, koje je obuhvatilo i štantane i elektronske medije i gde se vidjelo da dominira jedna agresivna terminologija kojima obiluju reči uznemirujuće, brutalno jezivo, pa kao užas, skandal, šok i tako dalje, a da ipak nema, dobro je, da nema tekstova koji sadrži eksplicitni govor mržnje, nego neko koje je to uvek uznemiravajuće. Pokazalo se da mnoge institucije ne koriste, nije se odnosilo na poverenika za zašitu ravnopravnosti, sva raspoloživa sredstva za borbu protiv govora mržnje i agresivnog govora. I među preporukama se predstavlja, između ostalog u aktualnom istraživanju, kaže da unapređenje praćenja 
negativne stereotipizacije i stigmatizacije kao i agresivno govor i govor mržnje, usvajanje smerica o govoru mržnje sa praktičnim primjerima i praksom Evropskog suda za ljudska prava, da treba podržati zapravo promociju i objavljivanje internog etičkog kodeksa javnih medijskih servisa i Takođe, pre tri godine smo sproveli istraživanje odnosu novinara i novinarki prema diskriminaciji i najznačajniji podaci govore da više od 90% ispitanih novinara i novinarki smatra da je govor mužnje prisutan u javnosti, ali je zanimljiv podatak da kada su u pitanju urednici, petina njih je zabrinuta da bi sankcionisanje govora mužnje mogo ugroziti slobodu govora. I da na kraju završim u pozitivnom tonu, mislim da je to takođe jako važno da bi smo menjali ovu sliku, što naravno nije ni brzo, ni je lako, mnogi problemi traju decenijama, mi već tradicionalno podeljujemo godišnju nazadu poverenika zajedno sa misijom OEPS-a za najbolje tekstove i priluge na temu borbe protiv diskriminacije i promovisanja tolerancije, ravnopravnosti i različitosti, jer i takvih tekstova nedostaje da bismo se bolje upoznali i zapravo shvatili koliko je bogatstvo naše različitosti i prosto jednog pronalaženja jedinstva u toj različitosti. I objavili smo i medijski priručnik koji je koristan nalaz za novinare, urednike i druge medijske radnike, I održali smo i u budući ćemo nastaviti da organizujemo brojne obuke za novinare i novinarke, jer verujemo da samo zajedničkim snagama, pa i ovim današnjim događajem i naporima možemo sistemskim pristupom da utičemo na staranje drugačijeg javnog prostora, a time i utičemo na povišanje kvaliteta našeg života. Hvala vam puno na pažnji. Yes, thanks to, thank you, Mrs. Janković. I'm thankful uh, to our panelists for sharing their opinions and experience with us and for opening a space for many questions that I hope we'll have time to address for our audience. Uh, please continue sending us questions. We are starting the discussion. We have around 15 minutes for it. So let me start with the, with the questions. How do we draw a line to separate hate speech from freedom of speech, taking into account the cultural differences around the world? Maybe Stephen can uh, start with answering on that. There is a, there's a tension between freedom of speech and of course, uh, restraints on speech, but there is no absolutes here. I, I know of very few countries that uh, are able to have absolute freedom of speech or, or absolute restraints. And it's always a question of, of balancing those off. I, as a journalist, <coughs> uh, love freedom of speech, but I also know that morally, that speech uh, is not, is, is in fact has to be uh, accounted for when that speech harms others. John Stuart Mill said many, many, many years ago, by the way, he was an advocate of women's rights, um, that in fact, your ability to swing your arm stops where it hits my nose. The same thing happens with speech that in fact, you have no absolute right to hurt other people in any society. And if we're going to think of society as a collective endeavor to cooperate in some reasonable manner, then we have to. I would think that basically what you need practically is not only um, these things stated in codes and in the constitutions, but we need a good history, we need some good legal history, uh, some good court decisions on how to balance those things that we can point to and look forward to. We need advocates who are on both sides who are always watching that the balance is, is, not, is not missed. So it's, it's an evolving, ongoing process. There's many more things, but I'll just stop there and let others. Yeah, uh, Mrs. Friedland, uh, uh, something, I mean, there are differences in, in languages and cultures, especially. So something that in my language and from my understanding is a phrase you might find insulting. So how do we deal with that if we're, uh, uh, if we're all in the same global space, like the digital space? Right. Well, you know, the internet has certainly changed things, especially with language, because it also makes the impact of language so much greater. We don't have the other visual aspects to count on that might make us realize that someone maybe intended something different than how we took it. When you're just working with language, 
in social media or on the internet or in, in news media, and it's only the printed word on the page, um, that can have a lot more force. There, there has to be some sort of cultural salience in anything we interpret. I, I think everybody would say it's clear that what's going to be something insulting and offensive in my language may not be the same in yours. It also is often the case that it would be offensive in your language, but the cultural, social, cultural expectations for a tolerance of that kind of language may be different. Um, and so a lot of that has to be just from knowing the norms of each other's language, talking to each other. I, I think what's missing, and, and this is, I think goes back to your previous question, is not so much the difference between hate speech and freedom of speech, but it's the difference between conversation and discourse and being so set in our own opinion that we, we, we don't hear anybody else, we don't think about anybody else, we don't try to get the perspective of anybody else. Um, and I think it's sort of the example that Stephen gave of you can swing your arm until it hits, it hits my nose. Well, we rarely know where someone else's nose is. Um, and so I think both the question you asked me and the question that you posed to Stephen have similar answers. There is no way, there's no objective way to say this is acceptable this is not and and it's acceptable and unacceptable in all languages a lot has to be driven by the specific culture in which that language is embedded but a lot has to also be from us having a conversation about why it's acceptable and why it's not and i think an example of this we can see in american media is the idea of language that is considered uh, inherently racist and there's uh, that is the site of ideological struggle right now and these are things like the word squaw or the word redskins um even things like woke, the word woke, which has become a very loaded uh, term, because what it does is it draws upon uh, a history that not everybody is informed about. And if we just use that term without any knowledge of its history, then it, it's offensive to those for whom that history is important and salient. So if I'm a Native American, for example, or an African American, but if I don't have a conversation about that, then the people that don't know the history may never know the history. And so I think what's really important is that we enter into discourse, civil discourse. And that's something that I think is since very sorely missing as of late. And the internet tends to make that a worse of a problem than a better one. Yeah, speaking about discourses and uh, about the swinging of, of my arm, uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Palmer, may I share uh, uh, with, with everyone an ethnic joke that they found that I find a really fun, a really fun. What would you say? Sorry, I, I don't understand the question. Are you asking I said, me may, to, may you I can? share with everyone an ethnic joke about about somebody's ethnics? I really find find that joke funny, but is it uh, appropriate to do? What would you say? The freedom of expression um, under international human rights law does protect um, the right to offend, um, shock, and disturb. Um, it protects the right to tell jokes. Um, um, so, you know, I mean, you describing that as such, yeah, sure, that would be protected. What I, what I just like to add as a caveat though, um, and this um, goes to um, points that were already raised, and this is again from the, the basis of my um, sort of expertise and the reason why I'm here for the international human rights law framework and um, 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 that perspective is that, um, you know, international law um, does require states to prohibit incitement to um, hatred uh, on the grounds of nationality, um, religion, um, and race. Um, although there is discussion about expanding that, and there is certainly soft law on, on other grounds of discrimination. So if that joke was actually um, incitement um, to hostility, uh, violence, or discrimination, then the state would have um, not only the right, but also the duty um, to prohibit it. Going back to those first questions that you asked, which were, were very um, germane to um, the stuff that I think about, um, you know, the, the line between freedom of expression and hate speech, it's a question which is often um, posed. Um, but actually, I think, you know, we really need to take a step back and understand that, you know, freedom of expression in and of itself assumes um, an enabling environment for um, diversity of voices, diversity of opinions, and that can't take place if there is um, um, incitement and um, um, the, um, um, an environment where, you know, th 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 there isn't the possibility to 
to have freedom of expression. So actually, I, I, I don't see that this is a, a kind of um, a dichotomy, actually. I think that um, um, laws, policies, but also um, responsibilities of, of key actors in society um, are actually on the same side. Um, as freedom of expression, uh, you know, in terms of freedom of expression and equality actually do go hand in hand um, together. And, you know, those principles that I that I put into the chat box earlier on um, really demonstrate the indivisibility um, and interdependence of freedom of expression and equality. And I, I talk about equality because that is the primary um, ground upon which restrictions on freedom of expression are imposed under the rubric, under the frame, under the frame of hate speech, for example, um, and just in relation to um, what Professor Friedland was saying, um, um, and some other comments from before, um, the, the the importance of context and understanding the context in which speech emerges is very important. It's something that international um, human rights um, bodies and um, um, commentators have been discussing for the last decade, and. Um, the Rabat Plan of Action, which I already mentioned, has this six-part threshold test, um, which provides a framework for analyzing um, any, any content. And this has been now um, adapted and extended to apply to, for example, um, uh, online content and um, um, the circumstances in which um, social media platforms, for example, um, should um, look, at, look at online um, hate speech. Uh, and remember, hate speech, you know, is such a broad term, it means different things to different people, it has no definition in international law, that it's um, highly contested. Um, but the, the notion of incitement, it does have a definition. Um, and um, in terms of restrictions on um, content, which may be um, identified as incitement from the perspective of international law, these are the six criteria. And the first one, as you see, is context. The so context being of great importance um, but also there are other criteria such as the, the position of the speaker, the intention, um, uh, the form of the speech, um, the actual content of it, the, the extent of the speech act. So is it online or is it to a um, smaller um, audience face-to-face, um, -face, for example, um, and the likelihood, including the imminence um, of um, the action that is advocated through incitement actually taking place. So, you know, um, just going back to what Stephen was saying in, in terms of legal framework, sure, there are constitutional frameworks and um, I agree with him, you know, um, you know, even the First Amendment does allow um, restrictions on, on, on free speech. Um, although there's this assumption that um, um, it uh, presents an absolute standard. Yeah, um, I have to speed you up a little bit because we have like six, seven minutes. Oh, okay. and I, I need oh, okay, to, I sure. need to add, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm done that. I, I'm done. Okay. I, uh, I just uh, want to share those six criteria with, with all the um, speakers and uh, the audience. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Bashir, uh, may I ask you, we, for, the, for the past almost two years, uh, because of the pandemics, we are living uh, uh, extensively in the digital space. Are we getting any better there? It depends on how you define better. Um, I think that, you know, trends and patterns and even research supports this. At the beginning of the pandemic, the world was really unified in its message. There was a lot of like hope and, you know, we're all in this together. But now, especially um, with all this vaccination stuff that's going on, for example, in the first world, you have people who are resisting getting vaccinated and uh, poor countries who have no access to vaccines. Uh, you have first world countries hoarding vaccines and then blaming, like we can see it now in South Africa. South Africa is being banned and you know, another five African countries are being banned um, across the entire world, even though it's, you know, reading the latest news before coming to this workshop today, one of the two of the first cases were in the Netherlands, but it was never reported before South Africa. So I don't know. I mean, I cannot tell you whether it's it's better or not at this point, but I think um, people nowadays live more in these digital spaces, and this is what might be scary. Um, we can see, for example, on um, Facebook, which is dying in some places as a social network site because younger people are fleeing away from it, um, that there is a clamping down because of 
what happened, for example, in the elections in the United States. Anything, you cannot say anything on Facebook, it's gonna be, uh, the algorithms pick it up as being hate speech, as being inappropriate speech, and it shuts down, it has a chilling effect on speech. And this is not what we want. And I think this is what um, other speakers were alluding to. Yes, there is no absolute freedom, but at the same time, it's a marketplace of ideas. You want everybody to be able to say what they want to say, and it's the best ideas in that marketplace that win at the end of the day. And I'd like to end by saying that, um, how can we control whatever you want to define as hate speech? I think the uh, idea or the notion, the concept of diversity, of having people being exposed to other people. And I'll give an example. One of the latest surveys that came out of the Pew um, Research Center indicates that um, one in what four Americans or one in six Americans are the only ones who were uh, or have met a Muslim, for example, in real life. Yet everybody seems to have this negative idea of what an American Muslim is. Yet they're not really Americans. They're not, they're not really part of the uh, national fabric. So again, this goes back, the responsibility goes back to the journalists in how they report. The journalist is not, um, in that lives in a vacuum. The journalist is her or she is, uh, or him is part of the overall society. You need to mingle. You need to go out of your comfort space. You cannot be in, in the echo chamber. So it's very important that we address this idea of going out and meeting people that don't look like you, that don't necessarily think like you. And I think we can understand better, not necessarily agree, we can agree to disagree, but why the other um, reacts or why the other acts the way that they do. Thank you, thank you. Finally, uh, Francesca, you're meeting people from different cultures in a, and they're very, in a very dire situation, of course. But do they have the common understanding of what is free speech and what is a hate speech? What is your experience? Uh, mm, thank you, Zora. Mm, often, um, refugees are coming from countries where um, media are not very present, uh, where press uh, also plays a very limited role. Even in social media, like uh, I, I'm, I met recently with an Afghan boy, and um, he, he, we invited him in a panel. Because um, then we did. Um, can we um, share your statement on uh, on social media? Can we use it with? The, and it was not um, even if, of course, they have a, a mobile, they have all, but they they are not exposed to the media power. And sometimes, even when they are interviewed, they are not uh, aware of the, the, the strength of uh, an interview um, a TV appearance. And uh, it's very important, as also mentioned other panelists, to really have an approach of bridge, to understand also the different culture and the, the, the background that they, they bring with them. This is also very important, not only to approach them and uh, to understand the different uh, um, also perception that they have of media and social media, but also to portray them as a human face, as not someone that, that, that to understand also the, the, the experience. And I think this value for refugees uh, displays, but also for many other um, minority groups and, and categories that are vulnerable, for example. Thank you. I, I believe we all only started to talk uh, about those things, and we are already at the very end. I think we are uh, about to, to finish it like in like thirty seconds. So many thanks to all speakers and media representatives who gathered here, and and thank you for a great discussion on the topic of ethics and values in the digital age. It was very useful to me, and I hope it was useful to to everyone here. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you to all of you, it was a pleasure.